Yeah, hi everyone and welcome to today's discussion on ChatGPT. So ChatGPT has been very famous recently, like a lot of people have been interacting with it. It can actually generate quite good code, I've tested it. It uh, can do summarization pretty well, it can tell you a story, make a song, just from some text prompt and then it will come out with another text output. So it's pretty cool. And so today's aim of uh, today's session is to try to dissect why it works and what are the fundamental structures that underlie chat GPT. So let us begin. So chat GPT actually consists of two parts, in my opinion. All right. The two parts are actually one is a neural network part where you use a, you use a neural network in order to do like the next token generation to like find out what's the next token to continue your sentence and so on. And then the second part will be the reward model. Uh, or rather the reinforcement learning part where you, where you learn a reward function for your prompts. And then, oh, sorry, the reward function is for the output of the prompts. You, you learn the reward function and then you basically align your model such that the model generates outputs that are high uh, of a higher reward. So this part is actually using reinforcement learning. Okay, whether or not it is necessary, we can discuss later. Yeah, but it's definitely an interesting idea how we uh, use reward modeling to align to human intentions. And uh, lastly, there's one part of this uh, chat GPT that is not really a neural network. It's more like using some form of API uh, where basically they moderate the content. They probably did some search for offensive words or discriminatory words and just basically do a blanket text for this kind of words. Like say, chat, sorry, we are not able to generate this. Yeah, so this is the rule-based part. It probably from feedback from the previous GPT versions whereby they spew out like violence or uh, sexual stuff. Yeah. So of course, this rule base, um, they did not really say how they did it. They could also have used some form of uh, neural networks to actually sense whether or not there's some offensive words inside the output. So um, there's this layer on top of the usual GPT. So before I begin, can I just check how many of you here um, have played with ChatGPT already. You can just raise your hand so I can see like who here has tried out the ChatGPT from the website. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, Evan Shushan. So you're not yet, right? No. Okay, yeah, I, I think a lot of people have played with it. It's, it. it's actually quite cool. Like I also use it quite a lot for uh, stuff like if I want to generate creative content, I can just give it some prompt and get some ideas. So that has been helpful for some parts of my research as well. You can also put in your research topic and then outcome some content. Yeah. All right. So let's start with how it first started. So it first started with this architecture called the transformer. So the transformer architecture is also um, known as uh, attention is all you need. Okay. It actually came out in this paper by Vaswani and other researchers. So the main idea of transformers is that you use some form of embedding space in order to represent your words or your tokens. Okay, I mean, we call it tokens because sometimes the tokens don't correspond to the words. They can be like sub words or they can be like some form of like different parts of the words that are more frequently occurring. Like you can use by pair encoding to encode those tokens. So basically you have an embedding space of your tokens. Why is an embedding space? Later I'll explain a bit. And then from this embedding space, we can then like ask them to do attention to each other in order to find out what is the true meaning of the word. So what do I mean by all this? Okay, let's start with embedding space. So for a very long time in uh, NLP, natural language processing, people have been trying to get the words to be expressed in a semantic domain or an abstraction space whereby it is meaningful. So you can see in this abstraction space here, of course, this is not like how it doesn't work so nicely in real life, but this is just an example that, you know, you have different dimensions. Your word embedding has a dimensions n. So over here, like n equals to seven. So it means that it has a vector of length seven. It, this is the embedding space. And in this embedding space, what happens is that you may have different dimensions, each corresponding to maybe a certain attribute. So over here, it's quite clear, like, oh, living being, being fairly, not all this, so like cat is living, so it's positive. Houses is not living, so it's negative. So hopefully we can get some form of clear-cut trait like that. Oftentimes we don't know what these traits are. Okay, they're just numbers in the embedding. But one thing is that if let's say you were, you were to visualize it using dimensional reduction, like PCA, LDA, 
you can see that hopefully the similar words like, you know, cat and kitten will come together. Okay, hopefully it's similar words like cat and kitten will group together in this semantic space. And then stuff like, you know, um, like for example, dog that is quite similar to cat and kitten would be like similar in, in space. And something that is very far away, like a house. Hopefully this will be very, very far away from like the living things. So it's like, you can see this like living and this the non-living. This is non-living and this like living. So hopefully you will get like stuff like this that emerge from the uh, word embeddings. So the trick in um, in a very long time for NLP is how to generate this word embeddings well. So the word embeddings, if you were to like train them on only like one word like that, okay, sometimes the word embeddings don't really match very well. Okay, so this is the idea. Um, the idea, is actually there's this thing called uh, polysemy. I'm not sure if you all heard of this word. It means like one word can have multiple meanings. So th there's this very big, very uh, difficult issue that has plagued like NLP for a while. It's because like you have some stuff like, um, let's see, the word bank. So it's like, I sat by the river bank versus like I, draw, I drew money from the bank. So you can see that the two banks over here, one bank has one meaning, right? So your river bank, you all, you all heard of it, right? River bank means like, it's like, let me just try to draw here, like dictionary, like right? the river bank is like, it's like a stream here of water. And then like, you are a person here by the river bank. Okay, this is the first one. Versus the second one is like, you yourself go to the bank. So like you go to a building called a bank. So you can see that like one word like this bank, okay, has different meanings. In fact, it can be either a noun or a verb and so on. There's so many different ways to interpret this word itself. So just having a static word embedding like this, which has been done in the past, like people have generated this word embeddings. Uh, I mean, if you are interested to see how this was done in the past, you can search up this kind of things like word to back or bag of words. Okay, back of words not exactly a, a way to do word embedding, but like word to back is basically like you take um like word embeddings, you see where the word is corresponding to the neighboring words, and then you give it a certain embedding. So you, you can train it using word to back. Okay, but more and more often we find that because of this case of polysemy, we cannot just do like a static word embedding. We have to do a word embedding that actually continues to evolve over time taking into account the meanings of each other words from the side, uh, from the left and the right, and so on. So this is one of the key issues. So word embeddings actually is, is the key reason, in my opinion, why transformers work. Because these word embeddings are so informative, they actually capture the meaning of whatever text that you want to generate. So ideally, okay, people have also done experiments like this. You take the word embedding for the man, okay? And then what you do is maybe you have king, okay? So you take king, okay? Um, let's see, king, okay, let, let, me, let me think, about, you want to get this direction here. So maybe you take woman minus man plus king. Okay, so what, what do you think you'll get from here? Anyone want to try? If we take woman, we subtract man, and then we add king. What, what do you think we'll get? Queen. Yeah, so queen, yeah. So, so this is the ideal. So we, what we want to do is we want to Basically, like if all these vectors have the same direction, like king to queen or man to woman, like this same direction of the of the embedding space, because like one is male, one is female. If we were to subtract away, like maybe the main thing, like woman and man are one pair, you, you, you subtract away woman minus man, maybe you get this vector here, this vector, and then you just superimpose on the king here, you can get another um another word that captures the meaning of like the gender shift from male to female. So the direction of the vector is very important in this word embedding space. So later you will see in the transformer architecture, there's a lot of things that try to capture this direction of the vector or direction of the embedding space in order to get a better representation of the embedding. So I highlight again, this word embedding, in my opinion, is the key reason why the transformer architecture is working and why also ChatGPT can, can work so well. So um, just take note of this. Any questions so far for embeddings? Yes. Um... Do you have, like, I didn't get why, how do you represent polysemy uh, in like a vector or like in, in the embedding vector? Okay, so you don't represent in the embedding vector. You represent by iterative, um, 
iterative going through of the embedding space. So let me just clear everything here so I can draw. So suppose you have like a few words like that. The cat is on the map. So what we want to do is like, for example, the word cat, okay, maybe there, there are different meanings for cat. What you want to do is you want to look at the words around it. And we want to see whether or not like there's any change in the meaning of this cat based on the surrounding words. So then we update, basically we update the embeddings with the surrounding words. And then we can do this thing multiple times. So you can see that this is done, like this is like, let's say one block of self-attention. You can repeat this n times, like you can repeat this n times. So basically the idea is that the word embeddings will get updated to the more accurate representation of what exactly that word is. Because we keep okay. the process again with the neighboring embeddings, neighboring okay. words. Yeah, so it's like the it's like the first layer is like you first get a word embedding, which is like a vector for each word, and then some part of the transformer also takes account of the context, uh, like a, the context of the sentence surrounding this word. Yes, correct. So this was not really done in previous architectures like word to vec. Uh, word to vec basically um they just take the like correlation of like the words that commonly appear between, uh, I mean, beside the original word and they just average it out. So uh, with that kind of embeddings, it is it, it, it can be also useful if you just start with it and then you update it using a transformer architecture. Yeah, but the kind of embeddings in the past when you don't keep iteratively updating it, it fails to like generalize to different kinds of contexts. So the idea of updating it iteratively, that is very important especially uh, in cases whereby you need to understand a very long sentence and the different words like it can mean a lot of things. Then you need to keep looking back at the sentence itself and figure out, like let's say the cat sat on, sat on the mat, they, like nothing can move it. So you need to like keep looking at the rest of the context and then basically the word it should correspond to cats. Yeah, so you, you need to see like, where in the sentence corresponds to this kind of thing. So this kind of iterative process is necessary, which hasn't been done in the past until the transformers came about. Yeah. Do you know how they arrive at like the very first word embedding in the figure? Like, is it, um, oh, is it right. some specific processes? This one is actually just arbitrary numbers. It's just to, but um, I believe for the one in the figure, uh, they probably just took some word to back embeddings and just, of course, when you do like transformers, you also can have the transformer embedding. So the transformer embeddings is uh, are usually the first layer, first layer weights. Yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah. So you can also take a, a train transformer, train from scratch, and then the first layer of the weights that you associate with each word, that will be the embedding layer. Because yeah, the inputs to the transformer are not necessarily words, but can also be part words. All right. So actually, I don't have this in my slides, but since you asked about this, the transformer actually the first layer, right? When you actually have your tokens, it's actually it's actually a lookup table, like a hash table. So like the first token. So let's say you have a total of like ten tokens. The first token maybe is a label zero, one, two, and so on until like maybe label nine. Okay, each of these labels will then correspond to a, a dictionary of returning of a vector of size n. So maybe like this will be like 0 0.3, 0 0.4. It's, it's, it's an n-dimensional word embedding or token embedding because <laughs> nowadays people use like sentence piece and so on, which are not really words. They are just like tokens. So you can have like, maybe here I just illustrate that you have three different numbers here. So then you can then reference these numbers and you can use these numbers as the input embedding for the transformer. So this, like by matching, like by reading off like a hash table, these word embeddings will then be fed to the first layer of the transformer. Yeah. yeah so this hash table over here is actually learnable. Yeah, but for most cases, when we want to like get if you let's say already have a pre-trained embedding, 
you can actually use the pre-trained one instead of like starting this table from scratch. You can initialize this table with the pre-trained embeddings if you already have a pre-trained word embeddings. Okay, yeah, I think that's more or less it. Y'all have any other questions on word embeddings? Okay, if not, actually this is the key reason why uh, transformers work so well in my opinion. Uh, the way they handle the word embeddings and the way they iteratively update these word embeddings is crucial for understanding of the entire sentence. So this is the way a transformer looks like. Okay, the transformer architecture has revolutionized AI. It started in 2017 and uh, even until now, 2023, you still hear the same word transformer. So I believe they have named it well because it transformed. Okay, there, there's a pun intended. <laughs> it transformed the AI industry, all right, using just this architecture alone. Um, the architecture hasn't changed much. Even until now, what we, would, what we do is we still use the same transformer architecture for all the different tasks like this. It's just that some of them only use one part of the transformer. Like for example, GPT only uses the um, decoder part, um, but uses the encoder part. So these are different transformer models. And then they, uh, the idea is they use like either encoder or decoder. The only thing that really has changed a lot, right, is not the architecture itself. The real thing that has changed a lot is the input and output. So over here, this is the output, and here's the input. The input and output has changed a lot because right now what happens is that we have access to massive data sets that have like been trod over the entire net. They have taken the web's worth of text, okay? not just text, even HTML code and everything there, scrape all this off the web, and you are able to use this transformer architecture to try to predict what will be the next token given a certain set of tokens. And it is so massive, this data, that if you have this model inside here that is expressive enough, you can potentially represent everything on the web. So this is what has changed. What has changed is not the model. The model has stayed largely the same. Maybe the layer norm has changed a bit, but the idea behind the whole transformer and why it's so powerful is actually data. Because of big data, you are able to make the transformer more and more expressive and able to handle more situations. So when, whenever you see like uh, updating of like GPT models, like GPT-3, GPT-4, they have maybe yes, more parameters, but in my opinion, the thing that is making the model better is not really the parameters, but the data, because the data is bigger. Like you can see the same trend also, in uh, vision transformers. Like vision transformer, the architecture itself actually learns slower than convolutional neural networks for images. But because they have a lot of data, this JPT300 by Google, I think, is massive. Because of that huge amount of data, they are able to outperform like just CNN's train on ImageNet. So this is something that is very, very important nowadays in the AI world. Uh, the AI world right now, is dealing with massive data. And with massive data, if you have an architecture that can express, uh, that, that can that's able to capture the essences of this data, then this model will be very powerful. And the transformer fit this category because it is, it is quite arbitrary. It actually works quite well for any kind of input and output as long as it's in a sequence. It can sort of map pretty well. Okay, the previous uh, thing to the transformer was called the recurrent neural network, okay? I actually didn't intend to cover this today, but since I'm talking about this point, I might as well talk about it. So the recurrent neural network, what happens is that you give it an input to like a, a cell, a hidden state. And then like at each cell here, you get like an output, like maybe one word. Then you have a hidden state here that gets transferred to the next unit here. And then you have an input to, and then you get another output here. So this was the recurrent neural network. Okay, there's one problem with the recurrent neural network. Okay, is that if we were to look at this like here, the output is actually a function of the hidden state and the input. Okay, can you see some uh, can you see something uh, bad about this architecture already? Like if you look at this kind of recurrent neural network, you realize that if we were to want to attend to like all these inputs from the very beginning of time, you realize that all these inputs here have to go through this pathway. So you can see that over here, this, this part here, because this vector is always the same, 
there's a bottleneck for information. So the recurrent neural network is not able to express a very long context because it is, it is bottlenecked by this hidden vector that you need to transfer between states. A transformer is not, because a transformer you can see, if you look at the architecture over here, the transformer can actually go through this skip connection like that. And in fact, you can even go over here, you can skip all the way to the top as well. Yeah. So, so it is very expressive. And basically this attention mechanism, you can attend, okay, this output over here, you can attend to every single input here. So this is very powerful. And this means that there's no more information bottleneck between the input and output. You can express everything you want in the output from all the input sites because of this attention mechanism. So yeah, I've been talking a lot on the attention mechanism and I actually like the attention mechanism a lot. Out of the entire transformer architecture, I think the one that's making it work is actually the attention mechanism. So let us see what exactly is this attention mechanism. So take a look at this thing here. This is Q, K, and V. You all want to guess what Q, K, and V stands for? Anyone? I mean, especially those who are familiar with transformers. Evan, you are NLP. Do you, you know what's Q, K, and V? I don't want to spoil it, but I just looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, so I, I, I'll just type it out. All right, it's the query, P and value. Okay, the reason why I want to give you this, this words here is because this actually more or less tells you what this attention is doing. So, what is a query? Okay, key and value, you all know. Key and value is like dictionary. Like, for example, you have the word like happy means a feeling of happiness. Okay, I, I, I don't make a very good dictionary writer, but you know, you know, if let's say you have <laughs> a dictionary with. <laughs> Oh man, this is, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, there must be some expressive way of writing this, but let's say you have a dictionary like that in a true dictionary here. Okay, you have you have this part here, which is the words. Like these words here represent the key. And this part over here represents the value. So where is it? Yeah, here, this is the value. So you have the key and the value. So in order to, like, for example, I need to find a word now. Okay, the next word I want to find is uh, jubilant. Okay, so jubilant is like a word of like happy, right? So if let's say I want to find out what this word jubilant means. Okay, I have a dictionary of all my words, maybe in the sentence or something, or all the existing words so far. How do I know like how much attention I need to give to each key? So for example, if I want to say jubilant, do I pay more attention to the word happy or do I pay more attention to the word sad? What do you all think? Which meaning would you want to extract from the dictionary more? The happy meaning or the sad meaning? Anyone? You want to just try it? Happy. Happy, yes. So I want to pay more attention. Thanks, Aaron James. Yeah. I want to pay more attention to this word happy, like maybe 0 0.9 the similarity between jubilant and happy might be 0 0.9. So if you remember the word embedding space just now, so maybe the word jubilant, I just call it J, and the word happy are very, very, very close in embedding space. And the word set is very far away from, from this in embedding space. So how do I know how much attention do I pay to each word. So given the query, like for example, query is jubilant, how much attention do I pay to, to the other words like happy or sad? So happy is very close in proximity to me. Okay, close in proximity equals pay more attention. Equals more similar, right? Yeah. So you basically want to, if, you, if let's say I were to play with you a game where, you know, like you forget all the meanings of the words, but I can tell you like, okay, your this word jubilant is most similar to happy and not so similar to sad. So what you can do is you can do like some form of attention mechanism where you weigh how close in proximity you are in embedding space to each of these words. Like for example, jubilant to happy, maybe I'm like 90% similar to happy and compared to 10% similar, similar to sad. So I can then pay more attention to this part here. This value, okay, will more or less be transferred to the value of this. So immediately from this attention mechanism, based on how close the words are, I can tell you what this unknown word is. 
So the attention mechanism weighs like the embedding space between, okay, between this jubilant. So you already need to know your embedding space. So embedding space, just take note, okay? You need an initial embedding space. Okay, whether the embedding space is good or not, you can fine tune later through the layers, but you need an initial embedding space. If not, you are, you are not able to find out what word is it closest to. Okay, you need to know this. Maybe I just write this here. This is the 2D embedding map. Yeah, so, so you, need, you need to know an initial embedding space in order to do this dictionary search. So I search the word jubilant. Oh, it's very close to happy. So jubilant itself will be probably given the meaning, a feeling of happiness. Okay, because it is closest in embedding space here. So how do we know how close the embedding space is? So that's where we look over here. So Q, K transpose. Okay, Q is an n-dimensional vector. K is an n-dimensional vector. Q, K transpose, if you know your matrix algebra, is like this. Q, K. So this is an n-dimensional vector. N-dimensional vector equals to Okay, if you all know matrix multiplication, this is equal to the dot product between Q and K. And what's the dot product? Okay, dot product in Q dot K. Okay, sorry, this is going to a bit of math here. I hope you all don't mind about this. Is equals to this cosine theta. So this means like, this is more or less like if you were to do like a, uh, a word embedding here, like this is basically more or less the, the similarity, the cosine similarity, assuming that Q and K are almost the same in terms of magnitudes of the embedding vectors. This is more or less equals to the cosine similarity between the angle itself. And let's say all this embedding space come from like a certain angle. Like, let me just draw in a different color. So if we have like a green color color here, like or maybe green is bad, uh, give use this dark red. If I were to draw like an angle here, that uh, like this is theta. And then this is another, uh, use a different color. And this one is another theta here. So these are the two thetas between for, for like the letters jubilant and happiness. And we can have another theta here for sadness. So the theta will be like that. So Cartesian coordinate starts from the right side and then you, you, you go anti-clockwise. Huh? So, so this theta here, Okay, if you know your cosine function well, okay, the cosine one, cosine zero equals to one. Okay, and basically, if let's say the two embeddings are in the same direction, okay, like for example, uh, happy and jubilant all point to this side, these two are going to end up with a very high cosine similarity and hence a very high dot product and hence a very high QKT over here. Okay, the bottom part here is just a normalization term. You can just uh, ignore it. Okay, I mean, you can also don't have it and it can still work. This one just basically they find that if you do a square root of the dimension of your embedding space, it kind of uh, regulates the softmax quite well. A okay, softmax is just a way to, okay, I, I probably need to explain here because there are some people who are not in the AI field today here. So like for softmax, uh, what the softmax does over here is basically, okay, let's suppose instead of like a very nice 0 0.9 and 0 0.1, I have maybe like 0, 20.9 and maybe 10.1. Okay, then you know 20.9 and 10.1. How do you know how much to like pay attention to each word? So one way is to convert them into probabilities. And a very nice way of converting to probabilities is to use the softmax function. Okay, you can use the softmax to ensure that everything sums to one. Yeah, so the idea of softmax is to sum everything to one. So like the exact equation of softmax is e to the power of theta i. Okay, there's of course like a, a temperature over here, which maybe I can add here, over like summation of all the e's. Yeah, so so your like this theta here is like maybe your your value 20.9. Yeah, so the softmax function, I think I wrote it correctly. Yeah, so maybe I put j over here. So the softmax function for, for the word i is basically like you use this exponential function here in order to calculate. And because the base over here sums up across all the, all, all the numbers, all the exponential numbers, you are assured that the entire softmax sum will sum up to one. So like after I do my softmax, 
what I should get is something like this. I should get something like here. Here maybe 0 0.6 and here is 0 0.4. Yeah, so this is the idea of softmax to make everything sum up to one. And then we can tell like how much attention to pay to each, each single word based on the query. Yeah. Okay, I pause here for a while. Any questions so far on attention? I have one question. Okay, yes. Where does the, the value come from? Oh, okay. So this is an interesting question. The value is the embedding space. So this process basically tries to align the words. Remember I talked about polysemy in the beginning? This whole process tries to align the words such that the embedding space becomes indicative of what it should actually be based on the surrounding uh, words. So if let's say I have a very high attention, like for example, like the cat sat on the mat, it could not be moved. So the it, let's say it has a very high similarity with the word cat, then you will soon treat it as equivalent to the word cat. Yeah, so, so it sort of aligns its word embeddings or token embeddings with the neighboring words. And it does so based on similarity of the current embeddings. So you are saying the value is just the value of the key in the embedding space? Yeah, so the V itself is actually just the embedding space. Then what are you doing uh, your inner product with? As in, your, you are in a, you Q dot K, right? So yeah, what correct. what is K here? K is the, based on the explanation, then K should be the, this should also be the value, right? So K itself, uh, the key itself is actually the, okay, let me think about it. So the value itself, yeah, you, you, are, you are actually right. The key and the value usually are the same. Yeah, for, for the case of like transformers in terms of word embeddings. Yeah, but usually what uh, we do in transformers is that they pass it through this linear layer to try to map it into some other space. Yeah, but this Q and K, sorry, this um, K and V can actually be the same. Yeah, you can see over here, in fact, when we do this multi-header attention here, you can see that Q, K, and V actually are the same. <laughs> okay, let me explain why. Okay, because uh, for example, you, you have the sentence, the cat sat on the map. And then the cat sat on the map. So this is like the, this is the original sentence and this is the, the layer one. You sort of want to like query each of the words one by one. So it's like the, you want to ask, okay, how much attention do I pay to the entire sentence? So when you want to do this, okay, this part here becomes the query. And this part here becomes the key and the value. So <laughs> essentially the, uh, the same word embedding is being passed to both the query key and value. You just go through a different like linear layer to map. But the word embeddings come from here. Like the Q, K, and V are the same thing actually. Yeah, so yeah, exactly right there. Yeah. Okay. I see. Uh, also, can you uh, could you explain a bit on what does positional encoding do here? Hmm? Oh, sorry. Oh, the positional encoding is it? Yeah, okay, definitely. Yeah. 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 So this positional encoding is there because uh initially this was actually uh a problem whereby you need to do a translation thing. So this input here is like your your sentence in French, and maybe your output here is a sentence in English. So you need to know like. If you don't put this positional encoding here, the word embedding alone won't tell you the position of the word in the in the sentence. So can you imagine a sentence like this? Uh, I am not happy. Okay, or I am happy not today. Uh, okay, I, I need to think of a way that the the can you think of a sentence whereby if I change the position of the words, it change the meaning. I am let's let me think of a, a sentence that. I mean, one, one easy way is like that. I am not happy and I am happy not for long or not. Uh... Okay. I cannot think of one right now, but the, the order of words actually matter in a sentence, right? If you change the word, sometimes you change the meaning. And I, I, I get it. Yeah. yeah or, or, okay. How about this? I am taller than a frog. Or a frog, 
Okay, can, you, can you imagine if you don't have an order ring here, right? You can have a case whereby a frog, you know, you switch with the word me and you still don't know that like the sentence, what's the meaning? If you were to swap the sentence like that, actually the sentence has changed in meaning. So a positional encoding is just a way to give you some form of embedding such that you remember the position of each word so that you can base your decisions on that position as well. Yeah, so the position is important. Hence, we have some form of positional encoding so that the transformer will know uh, what position the word is. So usually we use like cosine and sine positional encoding. I skipped the details today. I actually didn't want to cover this today, but the idea behind positional encoding is so that we remember the sequence of words or sequence of tokens. Okay, is, is that clear? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I more or less covered through like the rough idea of attention. I think this slide is more or less covered <laughs> everything, but let me just go through the rest of the slides just to uh, basically just to be more complete. So this is the original transformer whereby we have an encoder and a decoder. So as I said, this was used for translational purpose, like translate from French to English. So the original encoder here, you can see that this goes into the query. Okay, let's go back to the previous slide. You can see that this, this thing here goes into the query and key, if, oh, sorry, value and key. So this, okay, can you see what this is doing initially? Initially, this query and key, sorry, this value and key comes only from this part here. So you can treat like this part here, like this is the French sentence, is actually your dictionary. So you can, you can treat it like you are referencing your original dictionary with the key and value already uh, provided by this dictionary. And then you are querying it with your output. So the output here could be like English. So you are querying the model to see like, okay, if I have a key and value over here, okay, given by the French sentence, okay. If let's say I have a, a, a new word here, like for example, I, I don't know French, but you know, je m'appelle or something like that. It means I am, right? I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> so <laughs> let's say if let's, I think Shu Cheng, yeah, yeah, you know French, right? Yeah. So I guess je m'appelle means I am, right? Yeah. Don't know French. Oh, you don't know French. <laughs> so no, I, should used, I should have used Chinese. Yeah, I know Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the, the thing is, if you have like a sentence over here, then you want to like translate to English, like I am. Then I will be your query. And then you query this sentence here with the key and value embeddings. Like I, what is it? What is I most closely related to? So it's probably je. So you will take more or less the embedding meaning of je and put it here. So uh, original transformer had this property whereby you have a reference sentence that you want to translate. And so you use this encoder decoder kind of thing. And you put your encoder with the value and key pass and your decoder with the query. So your decoder can query the original sentence in French and ask like, okay, what kind of embedding space should I take over to my, or to my later sentence here? So this is the original transformer with the encoder part and the decoder part. So you can see that there's attention everywhere. There's self-attention in this part here. There's self-attention in the other part here in the decoder. And there's cross encode and there's cross attention, which is encoder decoder attention here where the encoder takes the query and the key and the decoder takes the, sorry, the encoder takes the value and the key and the decoder takes the query. So you can see there's a lot of attention and attention is everywhere. Okay, uh, that's why the paper is called attention is all you need. So the idea that you can iteratively update your word embeddings so that they become more and more precise, more and more suited to the meaning of that sentence, that is the key idea of transformers. Okay, I think the rest of the slides here, you can just treat it for leisure. Let me just go through like, okay, so first you uh, convert them into like embedding space to that, like here they are, the embedding space is four, uh, four, four, uh, four dimensional vector. You apply self-attention to find out, okay, which word should be more similar to the other words in the sentence. Then also there's this feed forward component that actually does some mapping into another dimension. Yeah, so this feed forward is just in case, you know, this mapping is wrong. So you have this feed forward that can potentially learn a better mapping. Yeah, so you attend to the other words and then you map to a different domain. So you just keep repeating this process again and again and again 
you get very precise word embeddings at the end, which you can use for stuff like generate the next word that makes sense, or like answer multiple choice questions. Is it A, B, C, D based on like whatever context that you have inside this embedding space here. So there's different ways you can use this embeddings here for downstream tasks and it's very versatile. So this is just the illustration. You can go to illustrated transformer to see this. This is like how the embedding space is generated. So you convert like your QKV to your dimensions here. So over here, the internal, let's say the original uh, embeddings are four dimension. So maybe you can, within the model, you can actually compress the dimensions to like maybe three, right? So this is not actu actually the original word embedding dimension itself. This could be a more compressed version or it could be a more relaxed version, up to you. Some studies have shown that um, the internal dimensions here, if you put it larger, it can be better. Some have shown that you put it smaller, it can be better. So there's no consensus here. So what? What people have done is that they just try different values until it works. Yeah. So welcome to machine. Uh, welcome to deep learning. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the, the idea here. Uh, Q, K, and B is basically the compressed dimension of your like your word embeddings. And what you do is then you have this this thing here. This is actually the 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 linear layer that you apply over here. So let's see the next picture. So after you apply your linear layer. Okay, what you will do is then you will see like, let's say for example, this word thinking. How relevant is thinking to the word thinking itself and how relevant is thinking to the word machines? So what you do is you do a dot product between the query and the key. So thinking and thinking, of course, the dot product is higher because thinking and thinking are mapping to the same like word. It's the, probably the highest dot product. Thinking and machines slightly lower because machines maybe is like a different kind of... uh. Uh, semantic space than thinking. So you can see that this is the end. In the end, you can get like the score, the higher the score means the more similar the words are to each other. And then after that, we divide by a normalizing factor. Okay, this is like the temperature term in softmax, if you are familiar with it. And after you apply softmax, you will get how much attention to pay to each word. So over here, what we get is that for the word thinking, we pay 88% attention. And for the word machines, we pay 12% attention. And that is to update the semantic space for this word thinking. Okay. And then now we go to the next part. Okay. Now you see we have the value here. So again, you have the value. And then what you do is you take this times 0 0.88. And you take this part here times 0 0.12. And you sum up these two components together. You get the final word embedding, which is Z1. Again, you can repeat the same process again for the next word machines to get the embedding for the other side. So this more or less sums up what's attention. Attention is basically using the similarity between the query and the key. How much attention should I pay to that value of that word? Okay, and then based on that, how much attention I sum up again everything, and this will be my final accumulated word embedding. Yeah, and then um, the power is that if you keep repeating this again and again, you can get very powerful representations. So this is the attention head visualization. Later, we have a notebook to show you this also. Like for example, the word eat with, okay, so I didn't cover multi-attention heads, but um, this process can be done um, across multiple heads. So this is actually one head. So imagine you, you have a separate mechanism that, that does the same thing here. So you can have a second hit here. This is hit number two. That, that does the same thing as hit number one. So this hit number one. Okay, you can have hit number two. You can have hit number three and so on. You know, you can do many, many parallel hits that uh, supposedly can pay attention to different things. Like maybe one pays attention to commerce, one pays attention to space, one pays attention to whether is it living or not living, you know, that kind of thing. Then you, what you can do is you can then combine all this attention together like, sorry, combine all these outputs here. In the end, what you can do is you can combine and maybe you can average them. Yeah, so there are different ways to like handle this. Or you can just aggregate them into one, into one big vector, and then you can just like, then do like a linear layer to, to get them back to the original vector. Yeah, so so there, there are different ways to process this, but the idea is that you can have multiple heads to pay attention to different things. So let's see, like in the next slide, like you can see like this orange color thing is one head, and this green color one is another head. You can see the word eat corresponds to like the animal. And then eat in the other head corresponds to tired. So 
okay, this is probably probably like cherry pick because when I look at like attention hits for other kinds of sentences, sometimes it doesn't make that much sense. But the idea is that if you give it enough attention hits, surely one of them will find a good relation. Okay, so this is a problem with deep learning in general. You cannot detect the model, uh, what exactly it finds out. It's all trained through back propagation. And then eventually in the end, you hope that one of these attention hits or multiple of these attention hits actually come with a relation that is important to your problem. So this is the idea. Attention and multi-header attention just is just meant to make sure that there's a higher chance of you finding the right relation. So you can see already this kind of models can be quite big because like this can be. All right. So all right, we are more or less done with the attention part. Uh, any further questions on attention before I go on to what GPT did to transformers? Yeah, sorry, I, I, I still, I'm still, i still confused about uh, in the period diagram, right, you have uh, output serve as an input. I don't understand what, 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 what does that mean? Oh, sorry, which diagram? Uh, in front. The output sheet, right, which is on the bottom right. Yeah, that's not the one. Which one? Not the one. Ah, uh, no, no, no. It's uh. Which one? Uh, the the place no, no the place we talk about embedding. There's a diagram on the left. Ah, uh, yeah, this one. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. What what about it? So why why the output is the input? Why the output is you mean this part here is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So basically. This part is actually meant for uh, it's like translation. So this is like a sentence in French, right? So the sentence in English, right? The output shifted, right? Is because this is the ground truth. So like for example, I am a student, right? When the model generates the first output here, okay, it actually generates the the word I, all right. You are supposed to generate the word I, but you don't want to give the model that information of the ground truth. So it shifted, right? Because for this output embedding, we only give it like maybe a blank space at the beginning and then I. Then once you generate the first word I, the next time you generate the next word, you give it the word I. So then the next word that it generates out here will be M. Yeah, hopefully okay. it will be okay. yeah. M. Yeah. I see, I see. So then uh, also the output probability is the probability over all possible words. That's correct. It's the probability across all tokens. So what normally we do for transformers is that we will sample from the output probability distribution based on the probabilities. We will sample the next word. Yeah, that's. So I, yeah, so, sorry. I think the support is quite quite big. Huh? Oh, uh, so for for example, GPT two, um, there's probably only fifty thousand over tokens of output probabilities. Uh, of fifty over fifty thousand over tokens in GPT two, so it's actually not that big. It's still okay. Okay, I see. Yeah, in fact, okay. uh, you know this AI, um, yeah. one of the AI pioneers, Ian Lacun, he commented on this before. He said that for the word domains, or uh, for example, NLP token domains, it is possible to use softmax because it is still tractable. The amount of tokens you have is is bounded, is finite. Okay, because you just have that many characters in language, you 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 have a fixed bound. But for pictures, you have like exponential amounts of pictures that you can have because like each pixel is 255 for red, 255 for green and 255 for blue. And then you have like a huge size of the image. So the amount of possible pixels that can be generated is kind of un unbounded. So he's saying that natural language processing is an easier problem to solve than image. So this shows you how small okay, in, in AI terms, this is considered small, the number of tokens that are generated. No, I just want to contrast like uh, image is a harder problem than words. Uh, is that okay? Oh, he, he left. <laughs> okay, I think he has a bad internet connection. But uh, let's move on, all right? Because I think I don't want to spend too much time talking about this part. We still have the reinforcement learning part that's quite exciting. So the next part is on GPT. So what exactly is GPT compared to transformers? So a GPT, right, is actually this part here. A GPT is only the decoder part. So remember, we saw that the transformer consists of the encoder, which is like maybe the French sentence, and the decoder, which is like convert to English. But for GPT, what, what they do is they omit the encoder part. They only show the decoder part. 
and basically this decoder here will contain like a list of of words already so maybe these are like the prompts and then what you want it to do is to generate the response to your prompts all in the same sentence so there's no more encoder there's only the decoder so because of that gpt actually is a simpler architecture than the transformer itself but the idea is the same the idea is that you need to pay attention to like the words okay over here uh, gpt uses a very special architecture called mass attention so what is mass attention okay self attention remember we saw earlier mass uh, self attention does for the entire block of embeddings but mass self attention just does for this block that is like before the next uh, word. Yeah, you, you know why uh, GPT needs to do this? Anyone want to guess? Why not just pay attention to these words as well? Anyone want to guess why GPT only pays attention to the words that have come before and not the words that have come after? Y'all want to, to guess like, what, what, what's the problem if we pay attention to like the word ahead? Okay, so should you want to try? <laughs> like, it's actually related to why the outputs need to shift right in the original transformers. Unfortunately, I have to go now. Have a meeting with my supervisor. Hey, no, uh, no worries. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the meeting. Can, yeah. So anyway, let me just answer this. Uh, question. Maybe let me let me give a guess. Is it because they wanted to make it like a conversational kind of uh, uh, model? So, like, it makes sense to have a temporal order <laughs> i don't know okay so uh actually the main thing is because uh what you want to do is you, you want to train it on like some internet text like the cat set on the so you have a you have a blank here so if we had given the original sentence as the input you can have answer like you see you you're like giving it the model answer to pay attention to that of course you can just pay attention to the map and get the answer so we want to make sure that all these are blanked out so that it cannot cheat you cannot know what words will come next. You will only have all the words that have been given before and generate the next word because GPT is ultimately a text generator kind of uh, architecture. But you still can do bi-directional, right? So GPT is not bi-directional. No, no, no. My, my point is like you can you just mask the word you want it to generate, but then you can leave the all the words behind that word still on mask, right? Okay, so what you are talking about is exactly what um this architecture called BERT is doing, B-E-R-T, bidirectional encoder represent. So I myself am more aligned with BERT as actually, because I feel like in a sentence, sometimes if you blank out the word like that, you may not get enough meaning to generate it. So maybe you can have the cat set on a mat, the mat was smooth. So, so you can like figure out like, okay, this blank here is actually meaning, uh, it means the word mat. So I, I'm, agree, I'm in agreement with you for this, that um, it will be easier to tell what word to generate next, given the next few words at the back. Okay. However, because the way GPT is structured is that we want to generate the words sequentially one by one, given the prompts. So we want to make sure that we don't get any of the words behind. <laughs> yeah, so the unique structure of the GPT architecture is because it was built to be a text generator. It only generates things given the knowledge of whatever it has generated before. So we have to do this mass self-attention in order to prevent data leakage. Yeah, but I see. So for, for the use case, it's not like still in the blanks, but it's like we want to generate test sentence. You can only generate from beginning to the end. Yes, correct. Okay. Correct. You okay. can only Sorry. generate from whatever you have on the left side and then you continue adding on to the right side. Yeah, and that is also why GPT can be quite stupid. Okay, because sometimes it doesn't really make sense from the beginning to it to the end. Okay, especially with like if you were to do like random token generation, sometimes you know a sentence if you random token generate, you might get a wrong meaning. Like for so example, the cat sat on the it's supposed to be a mat, right? Then suddenly the random token gives you a highway. And it's like, oh, <laughs> then how how do I continue this? <laughs> yeah, so 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 um the random token generation might give it some quirks to uh GPT because it just keeps generating one by one. Sometimes it generates the wrong word or because of the randomness, it generates a word that doesn't really make sense. You have to leave with it. Then you have to continue your sentence with that word. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the key, like, I wouldn't say it's a key issue, but one of the quirks of GPT. So sometimes you don't get very sensical output because of this kind of uh, generation of the next token. 
sorry, is it possible to like make it during a training, a learn in a bi-directional manner, but in the deployment, just let it gen generate like one by one? Is it possible? Uh, yes, it is possible. You can use the BERT architecture to learn during training. And during the um, testing, you use the BERT architecture to generate the next word. So you don't use GPT. You use the BERT, this BERT architecture. I see, I see. Yeah, so it's a different model altogether. I think BERT will be more powerful because it can learn more expressions uh, and basically get more like sensical output compared to GPT because it can look at the, the next few words. Unfortunately, BERT is not done by a commercial entity as big as OpenAI. So we don't have very large BERT models. So the bigger models right now are still GPT. Okay, got so, it. So I, I myself uh, feel like BERT will do better as well. But GPT has been fueled by companies with high net worth and they can get the data set. So, you know, we are using GPT now. Yep. GPT is also easier, I would say, to train because you don't need to like mass out the word. But then again, what you can generate will be limited as well. Yeah, so as I put over here, um, only having the decoder is not as versatile as the original transformer because you lose out the context to reference to in the encoder side. But because you lose out the encoder side, you can make your models larger. You can make the decoder block larger and you can attend to more tokens than before. Like you can see over here, it's like 4,000 tokens. Yeah, you can, I, I'm very sure chat GPT, uh, they, they reportedly say that it can go up to 4,000 tokens, but I have a feeling that actually it might be even more than that, yeah, based on my interactions with it. Okay, so let's move on to how we train GPT. So the training of GPT is very interesting, okay, because it usually comes with two parts. The first part is called the unsupervised pre-training, where basically given an earlier set of words, you predict the next one. For example, over here, I give you some examples like the, you predict like cat. Like over here, the cat is, they predict the word on because that's the next word. The cat is on the, and they predict mat. So it is very useful because, you know, in internet, all your texts are all like already fully generated. Okay, for example, if let's say this is my text in the internet, I don't need to label it. I can just say I'm supervised pre-training given a series of words, comma. All right, then the model will need to predict the next word, right? So the next word will be predict. So you can see your your prompts and your, your prompts and your label is already generated generated automatically without human annotation. And this is very important because with these properties, you can basically train on the entire internet and it's very cheap. You just need to script the data from the internet. You can train on everything already. Okay. This is unsupervised pre-training is used in a lot of domains. Like in code, you train over the entire GitHub. Okay, you want to train C++ code, you train over the entire GitHub of code for Python, C++, JavaScript, and so on. But then when you want to go for your specific use case, you do fine tuning here. So this fine tuning part, what it does is that like maybe given a prompt, you predict the sequence of the tokens to match the rest. Okay, so this is basically fine tuning is the same as like unsupervised pre-training, just that we have the fixed response that we run the match already. So for example, the question can be like, how many uh, how many legs does an animal have? And then the answer is four. So given that given this thing here, given this prompt over here, I want to train my model such that I will predict the next word, which is four. Or maybe you can say the next one will be answer. And then after that, four. So fine tuning is on specific data sets that are used, usually question answer data sets or like some data sets to see whether is it truthful. Yeah, there are some data sets devised by the community that if you fine tune on them, they are well labeled and they can try, try to skew the model's output such that it can generate like, for example, if you want conversation, conversational AI, you can train on uh, conversation data sets which is what ChatGPT is also trained on. Okay, so this is the two-step process for training. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, I have some question with you. Okay, sure. I, I don't understand how is the training on supervised because you do have the ground truth, right? You have the ground truth. So the ground truth is the entire internet worth of data. No, just... no, no, like for example, uh, you want to predict the next word, then you mask the later part of the sentence. After you do prediction, you still want to compare with your ground truth, right? Uh, yes. So after you do the prediction, so it's, it's a supervised kind of 
way. So yeah. your data set will be like the, and then you predict cat. And then your next sentence will be the cat is, and then you predict on. So all these are part of your data set. So why is it unsupervised? Okay, so actually this is the term that's used in the in the literature. This actually should be called supervised. Yeah, I, I also think it should be called. <laughs> yeah, correct. But this is the term that's used in the GPT paper, so I'm just following it. I but see, I see. Okay. It's actually uh, supervised learning. Okay. It's called unsupervised maybe because you don't need to have uh, humans to label the data. But it's still essentially a supervised learning problem. Or semi supervised. I don't know how they term self supervised. Self supervised learning. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Self supervised. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is Yen Lekun's favorite um, kind of learning because you can learn from observations, and that that can actually help with a lot of things. So uh, this is essentially in math how we would define it. Okay. Given the previous k tokens, and this is the neural network weights. Okay. What is the probability that I will predict the correct next token UI over here. And then we basically take the, the log of all the summations of the next few tokens. Okay, so you can just look over here for an example, like here. What is 20 plus two question mark, then answer is 22. So the log loss will be log probability that the word token is, uh, that the word 20 is generated given, given what is 20 plus two. And then what is the probability that the word two is generated? given this whole thing here. Yeah, so this is the idea. And the idea is you want to basically make this probability be as high as possible. So you want this probability to be as high as possible. That means it's generating the right word. Okay, so if we take a log probability, the log curve is, it looks like this. So this is the log curve like that. And this is at one. Okay, this is the probability curve, or rather this is like log. This is log x. And this part here is x. Yeah, so you can see that if we were to make, the probability is bounded between zero to one, okay? This is probability theory. So the probability is bounded between zero to one. And so if we have this as high as possible, this tends to one. Okay, anyone can tell me like the log curve, what is this value tending to? If the probability is tending to one, if x tends to one, what is log x? Log x is? Zero. Is zero, correct? So the loss is zero. So when you have zero loss, it means that uh, the network is perfect. Okay, when you have positive loss, then the network will try to correct uh, away from the loss. So like, for example, if your loss is like over here, your network by back propagation will want to minimize the loss. And then you will, you will try to head towards this part where the probability is one. So this is usually done. This is actually known as the cross entropy loss. Yeah, so, okay, maybe this is not the cross entropy loss. This is just basically using the maximum likelihood loss. Let me correct myself. Yeah, so this is the maximum likelihood loss. Where we want to basically increase the chance of the right token being generated. So it's a very simple loss function actually. And the idea is basically given like a current prompts, what is the next most likely word that I should generate? And so by minimizing the loss, I increase the chance of, of the right word being generated. Okay, so that's all right. Yeah, Aaron James, do you understand this? <laughs> I, I, I hope this was okay. Again, we come up. Okay, yeah, sounds good. All right, let, let's move on. So this is an example of how we do next token generation. So with like, for example, if we just look at this part here, because as I said, GPT is only the, the is only the decoder. So we don't have this part here. We just look at this thing here. Okay, what we can see is that, for example, the input is thinking machines. And then the output here, that the softmax here, maybe you can tell us like, oh, the next tokens are R and were. So, 80% of the time I can sample R. So let's say I suppose I sample R. So now as input here, I put thinking machines R. So this will be given here. Okay, and then I ask the model, okay, what is the next word that is most likely over here? And they come out, okay, useful and good. So maybe like 80% of the time I should output useful. So th that's more or less how GPT generates its text. It hasn't really changed at all <laughs> since uh, the earlier version of GPT I do chat GPT. Okay, but ChatGPT has more tricks up its sleeve. That's why we think that it's very good. 
Okay, so let me just give you all like a rough demo. This will take about 10 minutes about how GPT works. Okay, this is on a Jupyter notebook, which is used uh, using Python. Okay, that I like coded it out this morning. So let me just share with you the... Okay, can I just check whether you can see my notebook? This You should see this thing called, how does GPT work over here? Okay, all can see. All right, so this is the idea behind GPT. So what I do is I actually use this library from Hugging Face, okay, that contains like the GPT models. So if I run it, okay, I load a trained model of GPT that's trained from like the web data. I also have this thing called the tokenizer that is basically trained on the data that uh, GPT has used for the, uh, like for the web, like they base it on bike pair encoding. So yeah, if you're interested, you can search bike pair encoding. I won't cover this today, but this basically maximize the probability of each token appearing. So you pick the tokens that have, have, have the highest probability of appearing in your data set. So this means that your tokens will be used for many, many different things. Okay, so we can see like how the model works here. This um, there, are, there are a few things to take note of. This WTE is the word token embeddings, which means that there are five, there are 50,262 tokens and each of them have a hidden dimension. The word embedding dimension is of dimension 768. Okay, so it's quite impossible to visualize this. Okay, this is quite big. And we have the word position encoding of size 1024. It means we can have up to like 1,024 words. Okay, if you want to have more words, you have to increase the number of embeddings here, which can be done. You can increase it to 10,000, 20,000, so you can have longer like sentences. Okay, again, you also map this to 768 um, hidden dimension. And each of this, if you look at the transformer module, each of this transformer module consists of this GPT block, which consists of your attention module, your layer normalization, which will normalize the activations at the end. And basically you just apply this block Okay, multiple times, okay, with the attention module, apply this multiple times. Over here, you can see that we apply this block 12 times from zero to 11. And by doing so, we more or less get the entire um, GPT architecture already. So you can see like the number of words we have in the vocabulary is 50,257. Okay, because, um, okay, we have more words. Okay, so this is, this is not, this is, 50257. Okay, we have 50257 words in the vocab. Okay, we can even see like how the vocabulary looks like. So let me just show you how the vocabulary looks like so that you're uh, able to see like, so if, for example, this will be like the vocabulary. I have all like the tokens here. It's over here, these are like the symbols. Symbols, you can't really group them into like distinct ways. So these are the, 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 the most simple representations already. You have all the single letters. Okay, and then after that, you have like combinations of letters that, that are more like occurring, frequently occurring in the data set. So you see over here, this G character over here, this actually is like a space. So this whole thing is grouped together as one character, like from is four to two. Yeah, so you can see like URE is quite a popular word as well. So all these are given a token. So you can see the token are not exactly words, all right? They are actually using this thing called byte pair encoding to Seed out the more popular like chunks of characters. So these are my vocabulary. So what I can do now is I can just show you how this vocabulary actually works for like, for example, the word hello is 15496. If I put like hi, then the word will be like 17250. Okay, but of course, if I like do something like this, this is out of vocabulary. So what we will do is we will basically find the largest match of the vocabulary and we'll give it the token number. So this is exactly what is done in tokenize. So let me just show you how the tokenize works. So for example, hi, comma, GPT is a fun tool to use. It will tokenize it to hi, comma, then a spacebar and G, then PT and spacebar is, then spacebar A, spacebar fun, spacebar two, spacebar two, spacebar use and dot. And then we can also represent this in the text IDs like that. Yeah, so if let's say I want to do something different, like for example, I want to do like this. If I want to do like hi, I... okay, let, let's start with hi first. So hi will be tokenized as hi. Okay, if I want to do like hi, then it will be tokenized as h, 
and I, I, you can see that they have changed. How about HIII? So you will basically group them di di differently depending on what the tokens are used. So like over here, you can see III. And if I were to do like a lot of I's like that, you can see that the, the tokenizer words go to II and III and so on. So each of these will get its own token, which will also be the same tokens that we predict at the end of it using the probability distribution. We predict what's the next best token to generate. Okay, so for now, let's just move back to high GPT is a fun tool to use. Okay, these are the IDs that we generate based on the vocabulary by the tokenizer. Okay, let's generate some text. Okay, I just want to show you how like the probabilities are used. So I generate 100, up to 100 tokens. Okay, and then I also return the probability distribution so that I can show you how it's done. So you can see now we are taking this text here, like high GPT is a fun tool to use. We are generating like up to another 100 tokens. Okay, let's see what is my generated samples. Okay, so take a look at this. Initially, I have up to 13, right? So using GPT, I have like given this chunk of input, I generated 632. Then like given this chunk of input, then I generate the next one, 338. And then given this whole chunk of input, I then generate the next token, 257. So if we look at the probability scores, so I, I did a function here to look through the probability scores. You can see that for each score here, which is basically the next token to predict, you have a list of, of scores. So I have done the softmax already. And basically what we do is we just take the topmost score. So the topmost score occurs at location number 632. And you can see that this is exactly the next token that is generated here. So the next um, score for the next, the next token is the highest is at 338. And you can see that indeed this is 338. And you can go through all the way to the end. You will see like the last one is 314. And indeed, the last token that we generate over here, if we take the maximum um, probability out of all the output distribution, you will see that the maximum token is at token number 314. So all this match with our predicted sequence, okay, because I forcefully only generate the highest probability token. We can set the top K to be like five or six, then we can like sample from the top six or top seven or top K tokens. We can change it here. So yeah. Let me move on to the next part. Okay, the next part will be more interesting. So, okay, we can see what is the, the, the sentence that was generated by this uh, best token generation. You can see, hi, GPT is a fun tool to use. It's a great way to get started with your project and get started. So you can see the hugging face implementation, they tend to sort of like repeat words like that, which is not a very nice way see, over here, but I never really, you can see that it's not that great, okay? You can do things to mitigate it by like preventing it from repeating cycles. There are some commands that you can do. Okay, so let's just generate, like now we do like top five tokens and then we generate like up to five sequences and we can take a look at how, um, what kind of sentences can be generated using that prompt. So, you know, every time when you, you type in your prompt to like chat GPT, what you are doing is actually you are just like editing this text here. And then the GPT itself will then predict the next few tokens and then it will generate out for you. So that's more or less what GPT is. It just generates the next token given the prompt itself. So you can see over here, like this is the first sentence that is generated. I've been using it for a few years, so I'm not sure whether it works or not. I hope there will be someone who likes it. Yeah, so you can see that this looks like a block, <laughs> probably taken from somewhere. Yeah, then over here, I love it. So what's next for GPT? Next version will be much more fun and useful. Yeah, maybe. Okay, then you can see that there's more and more uh, sentences over here. Yeah. You want to give me a prompt? Then I can like try it out for you, like what it generates. Or, I mean, I guess you can also try it out on the ChatGPT side itself. Yeah, it, it's, it's similar. ChatGPT itself is superior to this. This is a GPT-2. Yeah. So just to clarify, here GPT-2 does not take into your first uh, prompt into account, right? It takes, it, takes, it takes this one into account. This is my prompt. I mean, does it have memory? Uh, it doesn't have like the conversational part of it yet. So in order to do the conversational part, you just need to have a longer prompt. You just need to have the prompt that contains all the past responses as well. I see, I see. Yeah. 
Okay, so I want to show you another one called the attention. So you can download this uh, package called BirdVis. You can actually see the attention in the GPT model itself. So for example here, the cat sat on the mat, nothing could move it. Okay, we can see like which part of the words attend to each other. So like over here, the attends to... Okay, so there's one thing that you notice here is that the attention only attends to the words before. Okay, that's because of the causal attention mass. Okay, we mass away all the future words. So you can see like mat is correlated to like mat, but it's also correlated to the. Okay, like nothing could move it. You can see that like there's some weak correlations to mat, there's some weak correlations to nothing, there's some correlation to cat. So this is um, one of the things that GPT may not be the, the best way to generate text because you can see that the word it itself, I expect it to actually correlate with the word cat because it and cat. But you can see that over here, okay, maybe I just remove all the layers. I just, I just keep one attention head because this is too many colors. Like if you look at the word it, it, they think that it links more to the mat than the cat. So you can see that um, GPT is not the best way to do like this kind of attention correlations, uh, but actually is much better. But GPT has been trained on way more text data. So overall, GPT is still nicer to use, right? For, for the GPT right now, like chat GPT. So yeah, that's, that more or less concludes like the attention visualization. It's pretty cool. You can see like, how the different words like link to the future words and so on. Like this is the, the previous words. Yeah. Uh, any questions on this notebook so far? Anyone want to ask anything? Uh, all good, all good. You all understand the GPT part? Okay. So I will just spend maybe the next 15 minutes talking about the, the second part of today's uh, presentation, which is, okay, so first we start with conversational AI first. So this is like the, the second part. I should have a third part after this. So the, the conversational AI is basically, they take into account all the past contexts. They put them as like person one, then put the text, person two, put the text, and all this will be part of the prompt for GPT. So we have to increase the context length to accommodate this longer history. Uh, GPT itself, uh, open AI itself in a forum post, they mentioned that they can remember up to maybe 3,000 words. So you can go try for yourself, you count 3,000 words, then whatever you ask it before that, the 3,000 words you may not remember already. Um, the prompt plus the response will add up everything. So you can try it out. I think it's around there. I think probably more than that yeah, because it converts quite long uh, with me and then I felt that it could still remember quite some time back stuff. Maybe it is just that the way human conversations work, you don't need to remember everything. You just need to remember the last like few seconds or few minutes of conversation. So that's why it sounds natural, even though it doesn't remember everything. Okay. So the other difference is that um, while GPT is like maybe trained on like, like question answer data sets and so on, like chat GPT, or in this case, this is the dialogue GPT paper. This was trained on dialogue data. So dialogue data that they script from like, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know which source, but Microsoft maybe own some like chat messaging platform or something. They 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 train it on those. Uh, if you have Twitter data, you can train on Twitter. Yeah, so so stuff like that you can train on this uh, dialogue. And I over here is quite interesting. Like, does money buy happiness? <laughs> Depends on how much money you spend. Yeah, it's quite interesting because like, um, you can see that the bot itself learn some essences of like how to chat with people. So like. Like you have no idea how hard it is to be a millionaire and happy. <laughs> so so um, this was of course cherry picked by Microsoft, but this is an idea of how like a GPT itself when trained on dialogue data can be quite powerful. Ah, so now we come to the crux of uh, chat GPT and why it feels so natural to us. Okay, is this reinforcement learning part where it's like more or less the secret sauce to tune the model such that it sounds plausible to us. So let's take a look at what, what is done here. So firstly, we have this thing called the alignment problem. So the alignment problem means that basically just statistically generating the next token in terms of probabilities, okay, may not be actually the best way to, sorry, may not be the best way to, to get you an output that a human likes, okay? Because what is statistically more probable may not answer your question. Yeah, so what the solution that uh, OpenAI is trying to do is 
to use some form of human labeling to feedback to the model such that the output sorts of aligns to the intention of what the user wants. Like for example, if I ask you, like, is it a good weather to go out for running today? So, I mean, maybe let me just write this down. Yeah, let me uh, find my annotation. So you, you want to ask it like, is it a good weather to run today? And then chat GPT should answer like, uh, it is sunny, there is low chance of rain. Um, you can proceed to run, something like that. Yeah, you, 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 you want it to align to what you ask. Okay, but if you were to use like the naive way of like the GPT way, okay, if you see this question, is it a good weather to run today? Then maybe if let's say it's trained on data, like uh, it's very windy, it is, it is snowing. It can even say it is snowing. Uh, like, the cars are stuck on the road. Okay, because like maybe snow and stuck on the road are correlated to each other. But you see, this uh, makes no sense to a human, right? Because like I asked the model, hey, I asked you whether I can run or not. I don't need to know whether the cars will be stuck on the road. I didn't ask whether I can drive on the road, right? So we need a way to align the output of this model such that instead of focusing on the next token generation only, we also focus on how close it is to what a human would expect the answer to be. So there's no easy way to do this because if you want to make it like make sense to you, you need to imbue some form of reasoning to the model. Like the model needs to be able to reason, okay, uh, I ask whether the weather is good to run, running involves going down to the pavement and running involves friction. So you need to make sure the pavement is clear. And also running is an open uh, out outdoor spot, but we want to make sure that there's no rain so that you would not interfere with the experience. So all these things are quite intuitive for a human, but you must bear in mind, okay, GPT has not experienced the world before. GPT only knows text. So imagine if you were in the room, people give you text to read and then you respond back text to them. The model has no idea what, what the world is. The model can only, only like, oh, someone asked me this question before. And then I remember a model response is like, oh, the, the, it is snowing. There are cars outside. Yeah. So, so maybe it doesn't have the right way to align because it hasn't uh, have all these attributes where it can reason, it can know the world. It's just a text correlation program. So in order to try to make it mimic what, it should sound like if it has all these modules implemented. What we can do is we can put a human in the loop kind of reward model to make the AI sound plausible to you. Okay, I ask you, do you realize when you play with chat GPT, do you realize the answer is normally quite long? Okay, who here thinks the answer is normally very long for your query? You can put a tick if you think the answer is normally quite long. Or you put an X if you think the answer is normally short. I agree that it's long, uh, but sometimes I'm asking it with details, so I, I appreciate the details that comes out. Mm, yeah, so uh, there's a reason why the prompts are long. Okay, so um, previously before human feedback, okay, the prompts tend to be shorter, uh, sorry, the responses tend to be shorter, but they may not answer the question. So with like human feedback, they normally, well, the human labelers like type a lengthy explanation, try to make it more clear to the AI what to do. So the AI picked up on all this. And so when they release the final model of like ChatGPT, the responses, the responses tend to be long because the long responses are favored by the human labelers. Because it's, it sounds more detailed, sounds more well-rounded. Okay, that at, at the same time, it also can mean that it spouts out a lot more nonsense before your answer comes out. Yeah, so, so this is um, unfortunately a drawback of the human in the loop labeling process in its, uh, because you, you don't have the right reward function. You try to use humans to like approximate the reward function by asking the human, hey, uh, you prefer response A or response B. Then if enough humans prefer the longer response, then it will learn, okay, I need to just get a longer response so that people will think that it's more credible. So, and then like, it can also learn stuff like, Imagine if, let's say, you want to ask him, like, should I go out today? Then if the answer is like, 
I don't really know. I think it is up to you, blah, 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 versus like response B, okay? Um, it, is a, it is a personal decision whether or not to run, uh, to go out. It has been shown that X, 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 X. Yeah, so maybe I just do a, an audience poll here. Okay, will you prefer answer one or answer two? Yeah, you can answer now. <laughs> we all prefer answer one or answer two to this query. Like, should I go out today? Answer two. Answer two, right? Because it sounds more authoritative. It sounds more confident. And that's why uh, GPT, chat GPT's output has been shown to be overconfident and overconfidently spouting nonsense. And... That's also because of this uh, human feedback. We like confident responses. In fact, sometimes chat GPT's response is nonsense, but because of the way it sounds like, it sounds confident and sounds authoritative. Sometimes I don't even know that it's spouting nonsense. I just assume that it's correct. Now when I look at closer look, they're like, hey, actually it doesn't make sense. Yeah, so this is one of the artifacts of, uh, of reinforcement learning from human feedback. How come I, I feel the first one is better? Because <laughs> it sounds more human-like. But it depends on what you are looking for in your AI, you see? You want your AI to tell you like more of like to guide you along. You don't want a very insecure AI, right? As in the second one sounds very like mechanical, technical, doesn't feel uh, like a day-to-day -day conversation. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's why I say it depends on what you want for the AI. So for but the your thing AI, is like, yeah, but the thing is like different people also have different objectives then so this alignment problem yeah it's hard because who to align with right correct so the chat gpt that you are seeing right now is aligned to whoever labeled it <laughs> whoever whoever says uh, so there are a few steps of labeling and uh, comparison let me just run through them quickly so um, firstly this is like more or less the prompt distribution for um, the system model called instruct gpt where humans instruct the gpt what to generate uh, of course, uh, this is not ChatGPT because ChatGPT did not, uh, rather OpenAI did not release how they train ChatGPT. So we base it on uh, an earlier model that they have released using the same methodology. Okay, They might have changed the methodology, methodology also, but because OpenAI is not very open anymore, so we, we don't really know for sure how they did it. But this is the best uh, approximation. So you can see that most questions that are uh, sent for human labeling are like generation, a brainstorming, open question and answer, because these are the stuff that um, the AI does poorly yet. The stuff that AI does quite well, like summarization, classification, very few prompts, okay? because AI does this quite well. So like, for example, here, at least five ideas how to regain enthusiasm for my career. Yeah, then maybe the human will give the answers. Yeah, so these are just an example of how the human labelers do it. So there are three steps of it. First step is the labeler needs to write the response for the model, and then the model will be fine-tuned on the human response. Remember earlier we have the like unsupervised learning, the fine-tuning step, and then now we do a further fine-tuning step on the human response, so as to sound more human-like, or sound more plausible to humans. So like, for example, explain the moon landing to a six-year-old, and then we will then the labeler, the labeler will then write out, okay, some people went to the moon, blah, 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 blah. Uh, like Apollo, Neil Armstrong, blah, blah. You can, you, you can write more of this and the model learns to predict those words. Okay, so this is called supervised fine-tuning. Okay, the second step will then be to generate a reward model, okay, whereby we want to give each output, okay, like for example, output A, output B, output C, output D, we want to give each output a reward and we want to prioritize outputs that have the higher reward. So how do we get the reward? We basically ask the labeler again to say, okay, out of these four explanations, or rather what I did with you all just now, like response one and response two, what do you think is better? So we just give the labeler two pairs of responses, oh, sorry, one pair of response and ask the labeler to choose either, either the left or the right. Okay, this is because human beings, we don't really give a value very well. We don't give an absolute value that well, but we can compare. So in reinforcement learning, we typically have a absolute value function. But we cannot do this for human labelers because there will be some form of bias. Like maybe you can rate this response as a five-star response. Then later you see something even better. 
there's no like way to like compare, right? So you the easiest way is to just give it response one and response two. You ask the labeler to choose you prefer response one or response two. Okay, then you can train on the data set so that we basically make the reward for the preferred option higher than the not so preferred options. Um, in fact, this problem of uh, needing absolute reward for reinforcement learning, okay, is uh, something that I'm trying to tackle in my recent reinforcement learning paper. I'm trying to do away with rewards altogether because I don't think uh, we really think in terms of rewards at the fundamental level. So yeah, but um, the idea how they, uh, they how they bypass giving an absolute reward is for the labeler to rank between choices. And then basically when we rank between choices, the loss function will make this choice higher, this choice lower. Yeah. So this is used to train a, a model to generate a reward. And lastly, the last model here, okay, does this reinforcement learning algorithm called proximal policy optimization. How it works, you don't really need to know. You just need to know it's a reinforcement learning algorithm that tries to maximize the reward. And so the reward comes from here and other factors. And basically what this does is that using this model itself, we try to get, generate actions that give you higher reward. And the actions here are actually the output is the responses to the model. So we try to prioritize responses that give you a higher reward. Okay, and then through this training, eventually your this PPO model will be the one used, the one used for chat GPT. So it's been trained to give you the highest, uh, the response with the highest reward using this PPO model. Okay. Let me go through in depth with each of these uh, steps here. So the first one, as I said, this is done using labeler jet demonstrations. This I think quite clear cut, so I won't go through this one. Next, the reward modeling. What we do is basically, as what I said earlier, we try to conform to the ranking of the pairs of responses. So if you look at the loss function here, this is the preferred option. So the YW is the preferred option. Okay, and we want this to be high and we want this to be low. Okay, you can see that this is a sigmoid function here. So again, if I draw the sigmoid function curve, it looks like this. Okay, I didn't draw the sigmoid function curve before, but this is how a sigmoid looks like. It starts from zero to one. Okay, and this is like the value. Uh, this is the sigmoid value of X. And then at the bottom here, this is X. So what we want to do is we basically want this thing, okay, because the log, remember the log curve, okay, maybe I need to draw the log curve again. The log curve looks like this. So the log curve looks like this. So you can see the sigmoid function uh, bounds the output between zero to one. And the log curve has a value of zero only when this thing is like, this thing is a value of one. So in order to reach a value of one, okay, your difference between these two here must be very large in order for this to be a one. Okay, so only when your reward model predicts a large difference between uh, whatever reward on the left to the whatever reward on the right, then you get zero loss. Okay, otherwise, if it predicts somewhere in like over here in the, in, in the middle at the bottom here, like if it predicts in the wrong direction, you will have a negative loss over here. Yeah. So the question that I actually have over here is like, you know, why do you still want to penalize? Like, if let's say this is higher already, if let's say the left side is higher already, you might sometimes end up in this region here, whereby you still have like some loss. So I'm just thinking like, why do you want to penalize? Like, even though you have the right magnitude already, why do you still want to penalize your loss? Okay, because like, what I'm thinking is that uh, if let's say this thing is already greater than the other side, then the loss should already be zero. So this kind of loss will be something like a hinge loss. Or basically like you just take the max of like maybe zero and the reward one minus reward two. Yeah, something like this. If you just take a max of this, if let's say your reward, sorry, max of reward two minus reward one. Yeah, if let's say your your reward two is smaller than reward one, then this will be negative, right? Then the loss will be zero. Yeah, otherwise the loss will be like a negative loss. So something like this, sorry, did I do it wrongly? Maybe it should be a, it should be a min, yeah. So uh, the, the idea is basically we have a hinge such that 
uh, we don't penalize the model when it predicts a higher reward of the left side compared to the right side. Okay, over here, we still penalize the model. So I'm just thinking, why not use a hinge loss? Yeah, I haven't really um, done experiments on this, but I think it might lead to better performance. Yeah, so this is something that OpenAI might want to take note. Yeah, so let's move on. I apologize for all the technicalities here. I just want to like cover this thoroughly. All right, so there's one thing that I need to talk about before we move into the reinforcement learning part. This is called KL divergence. So KL divergence is called callback divergence. And so it deals with two probabilities, uh, probability of the variable P and Q. So the minimal loss occurs when both probabilities are the same. Okay, and this you can look at um, Gibbs inequality. Okay, the idea is basically if you were to use a KL divergence loss function like that, your Q will eventually tend to P. That, that's all we need to know. So the KL divergence just basically um, brings the distribution of Q closer to the distribution of P. Okay, and this will be used in the reinforcement learning architecture as you will see later. So this is the reinforcement learning part. So as I said earlier, the PPO takes in the prompt as the states. The action will be the response by the reinforcement learning model. And then the reward will be given by the objective function. And this objective function consists of three parts. The first part of the objective function is the reward model that was generated in step two, where the human labelers will label the reward model. Okay, so this will basically mean that um, we want to focus on actions that give you the higher reward by the reward model. Okay, but we have additional terms in the reward function here. So here, this is the KL divergence between the reinforcement learning model, okay, which is this PPO model, and this SFT model, which is called the supervised fine tuning model, which is at step one. Okay, what we want to do is basically they have found out that if you just use this reinforcement learning to train itself, after a while, the responses it generates will be like very off the charts. It may not even be make sense anymore. So they want to like they want you to they want the model to align to humans, but not too far. Like they hand hold the, the model back, like, hey, don't go so far. Stay true to your belonging, uh, stay true to your beginnings. Okay, you used to do this prediction here. You used to predict this token. Why? I want to make sure that you predict as close as possible to your original token. So I do this KL divergence loss. Remember what this KL divergence loss tries to do? It tries to make the probability of distribution Q closer to distribution P. Okay, if I remember correctly, it's like that. Q, P. Okay, so this slightly different. Here is uh, D pi R. But the idea is basically we want to make the reinforcement learning algorithm conform to the outputs for the su supervised fine tuning model. So we want the reinforcement learning to make it go to haywire. Okay, and lastly, they also added one last term here, which is the cross entropy loss to conform to whatever you see, the distribution you see in your pre training set, which is your data sets. You want to make sure that the model still outputs like a loss that is similar to whatever distribution that we have seen earlier. Yeah, so this basically makes the model uh, predict like the original data sets to more or less the same way. So these two losses are these two losses constrain the model such that the model still makes sense after reinforcement learning. And then this loss over here is to just use the human labeler feedback to train the model. So I have a few questions with this. I actually disagree with this method. I think it's too complicated. As you can see, this full function here, you are like constantly trying to restrain the model from deviating too much. What it means is that probably your labeled data is too little. And because your labeled data is too little, you try to use whatever labeled data to try to generalize across other domains. Or other other prompts, you might end up with uh, incorrect outputs, and you know all these two losses here are kind of mitigating measures. Over here, this is just a technical thing. Why do we use cross entropy? So why not use cross entropy rather than KL divergence? Because you can actually take out one of the terms here. You can actually just use the, you can just use like, uh, pi. You can just use like p log p instead of like p log q over p. Oh yeah, so so like this cross entropy loss is sorry, not p log p. I said it wrongly. Yeah. You can actually use like stuff like p log q in order to like do this whole KL divergence loss instead of like doing this very complicated functions. Why not just use cross entropy loss? So 
these are some technical questions that I have. Yep. Oh, um, sorry. Are you able to hear what I'm speaking, by the way? Yes. Okay, can hear already, right? Yes. Okay, so this is the more technical part. Okay, I have a lot of questions here. I have no answers for this, but this is just my take on it. I feel like this is unnecessary. This step three is unnecessary. What we could do is we could just stop at step two. We could just stop at step two. Okay, and what we do is we have this reward function trained already, right? Then you ask the model to generate like 100 or 1,000 prompts, and then you just rate the response, and then you just output the response that has the highest reward. I think we can just stop at step two and the model will work pretty well already. Okay, I think this PPO thing is, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would like to be convinced, but I'm not convinced at the moment that this is necessary. All right. So um, this is what uh, data has been used. They use about 30,000 prompts for reward modeling. And basically they generalize to, hopefully generalize to majority of the prompts. So you can see that uh, we use like, for example, over here, we use like about 30,000. The PPO data, they use, a, they use a few more prompts. Yeah. But I think just stopping like at this step is enough already. Yeah. This is my take, okay? This is not the official take of OpenAI. I think we can just stop at this too. Okay, this is the results of the alignment. So you can see that after supervised fine training, it like on a scale of one to five, or one to six, I think, one to seven, sorry, one to seven, they ask human labelers to basically predict how, how good the response is. So you can see that GPT, the response is quite lousy. It's like less than, less than four, <laughs> it's like two. Prompted is three, but with supervised fine tuning, with some labelers guiding it how to respond, it goes very close to four, which is like the average score. But instruct GPT with like reinforcement learning. Okay, it actually achieves like five, around five. But you can see that um, the score itself did not improve much by increasing the model size from 6 billion to 175 billion. So there must be something else that we can do to make the response more plausible to humans other than just uh, increasing model size. We could use like, like more modules in the, um, in the GPT itself, yeah, like reasoning module or like some modules to like do some form of calculation and so on. Yeah, so, so this means that there's a limit to like how good human feedback can be used to improve the model. There must be some form of, I feel like there must be other forms of uh, modules or add-ons to GPT in order to make it better, in order for the response to really sound more plausible. Yeah, so it's quite amazing. They only use 40 labelers for instruct GPT, but for chat GPT, I think they use a, a lot more labelers. Okay, if not, it can't be that good. Okay, it's undisclosed and could be higher than, than 40. And uh, one of the amazing things is that with such few labels, it can sort of generalize to other out of sample data, or rather out, other out of uh, labeling distribution data, which is impressive. Okay, again, I don't know how much of it is attributed to step two and how much of it is attributed to step three. My view is that step two is enough. Okay. So uh, the last part of today, I'm just going to touch on something lighthearted. This is called the moderation API. So um, just using neural networks alone is not sufficient uh, in order to filter out bad content. So they actually use some form of rule base or some uh, moderation tools in order to prevent the model from generating incorrect output or sensitive output. So yeah, you can see that over here, neural networks are hard to configure because they are still like black boxes. Okay, we cannot ask the model not to do something. So we apply some form of moderation over ChatGPT in order to moderate the outputs. So you can see this is what happens next. Um, like this is from the site itself. The API takes in the text. And then it checks whether it, it falls into any of these categories, spread box categories. If it's not flagged, the text will come out. If it's flagged, okay, then this input text will be withheld from the consumer. And, other, and, and, and basically, a, a sample text will come out. So for example, like that, you want to ask, how do I bully something? Then they will come out with some filler text. It is not appropriate or ethical to bully anyone. So yeah, this is basically how they try to prevent negative content from coming out. Strengths and weaknesses. So maybe we can discuss this more later. Like, uh, it's great for combining human knowledge in novel ways. Uh, adaptable, creative. Great for coding. I use it for coding, and I think it's a great coding machine. It can come out with codes for many different situations. Simple codes, okay, not complicated ones. 
it, summarizing text is good, good for doing homework with uh, regurgitation involved. It regurgitates quite well. Okay, especially like those kind of essays, like philosophical essays, you can do it quite well and can chat on uh, most topics. Uh, but it's not very good for fact checking, not very good for reasoning. Uh, it can be overly confident and over, overly ambiguous at times. And also not good at math. There, there are actually many more weaknesses not uh, stated here. But um, ChatGPT is definitely not perfect, but it has a lot of strengths already that can be used for different uh, purposes. Okay, so discussion. Okay, maybe we just spend like maybe one to two minutes on this part here. So like, why not use a hinge loss for reward model? I don't know. Do you all agree with me that a hinge loss would be better? Like we don't penalize the model for, for making like, if let's say the reward one is higher than reward two, we don't penalize the model anymore. Yeah, we only penalize reward, the model. What's reward two again? Oh, so this is the human labeler, um, the data. So if let's say the human say that the prompt one is, is better than prompt two, then I pass it through my reward model to get a reward. And as long as my reward is higher than this one, then I, I want it to make it loss of a zero. So the, the reward is basically a scalar reward that takes in the, the prompt and the response and comes out with like a reward value. Uh, uh, sorry, did I, explain, did I explain well? I was just thinking like, basically, basically when R, R1 larger than R2, it means that the yep. human labelers has no problem against the output, right? Yes, correct. Then it conforms to the human output. So I'm thinking that if it conforms to the output already, why penalize it? Why not just leave it yeah, as Okay, way? yeah, if you extend that way, I agree. Yeah, okay. So this is one gripe I have about this. Uh, I'm not sure why they did that loss function, but um, I'm not, uh, I, I don't think that's like the best way to do it. Okay, so why not use a hinge loss? Uh, is PPO necessary? So that's a big question I have. Okay, is PPO necessary? Why not just use the reward model to like to select what prompts to come up with? Because I think the reward model is good enough already. You use the reward model, you can already tell like whether or not a prompt, or sorry, whether or not a response is good because the reward model sorts of like it should sort of already generalize to all kinds of input contexts, right? Because you use a neural network. So I'm not sure why PPO is needed. <laughs> my question here is why not just use the human labeler fine-tune model uh there's no fine-tune model for human labelers oh you mean the why not just use the first model is it without the yeah reward? the stage one stage one uh, okay so actually uh the reward model does play a role because with the stage one right you may not uh show enough examples for the model to learn but for stage two if you give a reward model to each of the prompts you can use this reward model as a proxy for a labeler so it, it is like basically having a labeler every single time. Yeah, so so I think there's still some use for this reward model. Okay, and, and how, I still actually confused how is the RL model coupled with the GPT model? Is it oh, like uh, the state is the prompt, right? Then the GPT output the different possible yeah. Answer that the RL model select which one. Yeah, so over here you can see like the PPO model is the final model for chat GPT. This basically is the uh given the prompt generate the action, right? Which is the response. But over here it's been trained to maximize uh take actions that maximize reward. And the reward basically is given by the reward model, which is like the step two. But they also have other laws to like constrain the model to make sure it doesn't go too far off, which are these other two losses. Okay, how, how does the PPO ge directly generate the prompt? I don't understand. Oh, Is it like uh, it, it emerged together with the GPT or something? No, no, no. So the PPO is basically a way, like for reinforcement learning agent, it takes in a state and the state could be the prompt and the action can be like one of the, basically the action can, can be like one single token or the action. So over here, they, they didn't really make it very clear, but let's suppose an action is just the next token. So given the next token, maybe your reward model can really give you like some rewards already. So I, what I feel is that um, for this action here, um, it is basically like either the next token or the entire series of tokens generated. And then 
based on the reward that we get from the reinforcement learning model, we can sort of configure the model or the agent to take actions or rather to generate prompts or to generate responses that are more in line with maximizing reward. So, but, the, but where is the GPT? Oh, the GPT comes in here. Like this thing is the GPT itself. This this thing here is GPT. This policy is the GPT. But PPO does not have the same structure as a GP as a transformer or decoder part of transformer, right? Oh, they use the same structure then. What? Yeah. So the so I, they use the they use the GPT as the policy network for the RL yes, model. Yes, yes, yes. The policy network. Oh, what? Network. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that that's why it's so com confusing. Yeah, I, I think it, I think it's not needed actually. I think we can I, just I, we can just use. I, it. I thought I thought like the 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 RL is like a surrogate model to help to select which it's like a human labeler trying to select not, which not the surrogate which model is part. The surrogate model part is here. Is this part here when you get this reward? I thought this was the surrogate model. That you can then use this reward to then select the prompts, uh, to select the response. I thought it was like that also. So I think. To be honest, my own gut feeling tells me we can stop at step two, but they went on ahead to do step three. So, so the PPO is already end to end. Oh, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> this is very complicated actually. Yeah. So I don't think this is necessary, but then again, but, but, but this, uh, one comment on, you have some, some things against the, the KL loss part, right? Oh yeah. Because I feel uh, like, I, I, I think that's, that might have something to do with the original formulation of PPO because they do have this KL term. Mm. Yeah, uh, because P PPO, I, I just read the paper recently, it is like trying to improve based on the trust, trust region TRPO. Then the Q, the P is the basically trying to, yeah, as what you mentioned, trying to not deviate too much from the original one. Otherwise, it can cause some like catastrophic behavior. So this is like a reformulation of that. So so it's I think it's already part of the the, the PPO objective. Yeah, no, because yeah. you see, if you do KL divergence loss, it's like that. P log actually is P log Q over P, but you can rephrase it as P log Q minus P log P. Okay, and then uh this P log P, okay, because this is this is like this P log P part more or less you can treat it as a constant. Usually, then we can just focus on P log Q. So I'm thinking, why not we just use like cross entropy loss instead of KL divergence loss over here? Yeah, so um, I don't know. Maybe this P log P is not a constant because this P actually is pi RL, which may change over time. So one reason why I think that you don't use cross entropy may be because this P log P term is not a constant. Yeah. Well, it's, similar, it's similar to the DQN case, right? Your target. It's, it's keep changing, right? Yeah, correct. But I'm thinking that once you do the loss function, it's okay if the target keeps changing because we are happy with a moving target anyway in PPO. We just need but to- But it might, co it might cause some problem of in, in convergence. Yes, yes. Yeah. So maybe that's why they use the entire KL loss here. Yeah, so there's some technicalities here that I'm, I may not be aware of, but this kind of works for them. So good. <laughs> uh, personally, I wouldn't have done PPO for this problem. I think it's a uh, like using a bulldozer for like gardening or yard is a bit too too extreme. Yeah, but who knows? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Maybe we move on to the next question because it's it's kind of late already. I want to end it soon. So like, should we generate only the next token? Um, usually for GPT, as what we've seen earlier on, it only generates the next token. So why not generate the next n tokens? So I was thinking that maybe we could do like, like for example, you generate the next n tokens and then you just rank the next n tokens which are is better. So this might actually improve the performance. Okay, maybe it's already done for chat GPT, okay, but uh, this is something that we can take note of. We may do like next n token generation so that the the generated output sounds nicer. I I do agree with this one because I was just I was also thinking like if you're asking the calculation question right 21 that one it doesn't make sense like you predict your two first then you predict next one based on two right because the answer is totally based on your question that's correct so it has nothing to do with the fact you start with the two first it's the, the answer itself is one thing one entity 
So yeah, I do agree. <laughs> Maybe in yeah, you, many you kind of situation, uh, Chat GPT sucks at math. And that might be the reason because it like generates the next token. And if you do it randomly, it kind of has a problem that uh, it may generate the wrong digit. <laughs> then it will affect everything else. So, so it still doesn't resemble how human thinks. It's yeah. quite far-fetched from how we think. All right. So some people have said that why not combine like ChatGPT with like Wolfram Alpha, which is a math, uh, math symbol kind of program. I think that actually kind of helps GPT a lot because GPT is not very good with this kind of modules. Right now, GPT is just takes, takes in a, a text and then you go through the GPT model and then out, comes out with the output. So right now, it's still a text-to-text -text and it's lacking a lot of key faculties inside this GPT that maybe we could imbue GPT with more of this stuff like math. Okay, let me just type here, math. Yeah, we could have internal modules like math. I don't know whether you want to have a logic or you can have some form of like ca causal relations, knowledge web, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, we could have more of these modules here that can help it to create like better predictions. And you can put it all of them inside this GPT itself to use it to I also like... I also agree on this because I think last time we mentioned that why whether human think logically or not, but I do think for certain tasks, we do have a kind of symbolic reasoning. Uh, module, I, think, like, I, mm, yeah. I agree. So I think, we need I think combine, it makes sense. We need to combine symbolic reasoning also in order to go to the next level. Yeah. Also, oh, okay. Let, let's go to, go to the last question. I quite like this last question a lot. So I always like to ask people who use ChatGPT, okay? Do you think ChatGPT can generalize to like unseen prompts? Okay. Or is it that it's been trained on such massive data that whatever you can think of in your head has already come up somewhere in the internet and actually is being able to generate stuff that's plausible because it's all within sample. So what do you think? Do you think we are being we are able to give it out of distribution stuff or is everything still within the distribution? I don't know. I, I thought I like my thought on this is even though it's not like exactly the same thing, right? But once you already train on such a massive data set, it becomes much easier to just interpolate as opposed when you have very sparse data. It's like, it, uh, it's very simple, like how we do exam, right? We practice as much, a lot, but after we practice a lot of questions, then even though the question is not exactly the same in the exam, we can kind of, it's much easier than compared to just do one or two questions, right? That's why we also want to, even for people want to practice more. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I do think there's a merit to scaling up the data sets, definitely. And uh, yeah, I also feel like because you scale up, you can interpolate more. More things become within your interpolation and hence the model still sounds nice even though you change like stuff that you may not have seen before, but you can interpolate between two different prompts. You can still get something nice. So I think scaling up really helps with this point. Yeah. I, I think scaling up is important. It's just that I feel like there needs to be more other than just the transformer model. That's what we discussed earlier, the neuro symbolic part, the reasoning part, all this could be inbuilt in somewhat, okay? All right, so this is the more like relaxed area. Maybe we just spend about five minutes think, uh, talking about this. Like, do you think chat GPT should be used to fight like law cases, like niche areas? What do you think? You know, recently there's this company called Do Not Pay that wants to offer any lawyer or person $1 million if you put on like AirPods and just repeat whatever the AI tells you to repeat in court. Yeah, so do you think ChatGPT should be used for this kind of areas? Yeah, maybe we get some of the comments from, from, from you. Okay, if, if no one, okay, maybe let me try, let me just say something first. Uh, I, I think like a very, uh, a lot of people on, on this issue, right, a lot of, people still think for this kind of high stake application, we need to have interpretable way of doing things. Uh, so especially in law, right? Then this, we need to have a way of give some reasoning of why you have uh, such output, right? Because it's high stake and we need to conform to the, to the regulation and whatever stuff. Yeah, so. But, but I was thinking, right, maybe it's a hot take on this, but I was thinking, like, even for humans, uh, we don't, 
we don't really, sometimes we don't really know the incentives of the lawyer. Maybe it can on the surface can argue very very good, but you never know like what's the true incentive of the lawyer do arguing for certain ca cases, right? So yeah, I, I think it's a it's a very great area and yeah. I don't really have a good answer for it, but just some random thought. Uh, my personal take on this is uh, as long as it doesn't have a fact checking module, you shouldn't put it for law because <laughs> you might give very random and weird responses. Yeah, so I don't think chat GPT is suitable for, for cases whereby the stakes of failing are high because law is like uh, if, if the stakes of uh, wrong response is high. I mean, you can get someone in jail, you know? Yeah, so when we have stuff like that, maybe we shouldn't use like a generative model to do it. We should do a model whereby you can do more fact checking, more reliability. Yeah. So I don't think we should use ChatGPT for very high stakes and uh, areas that require reliability, but we can use it for stuff like generating creative content, like storybooks, definitely, because you write a word wrongly, it's fine. I mean, no one's really like going to be like, no one's really going to be impacted if let's say the content turns out wrong not as high, not as much as like stuff like law or I mean, if you use chat GPT for self-driving car purposes, like if you treat the input as a text and output as a text, I'll be quite worried. Okay. Because like of the way it's randomly generating the text sometimes, you know, why if you randomly swap your car to the left or right, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, I think chat GPT should only be used in low stakes situations. All right. So let's move on to the next question. Should chat GPT be banned for students? Because you know, some questions in exams, you can put in the exam question and out comes the answer already. So do you all think that we should ban this for students? Or should we be able to use like chat GPT, like, like just like the Google search or calculators? Yeah, I want to hear your take on this. I think this one quite straightforward, right? It's, it's like for certain exam, if you're trying to test use certain abilities, like certain, for, for example, so, uh, in elementary or primary school, then you're trying to test your ability to do calculation. Then, of course, you are not supposed to use a calculator, right? So it's the same thing here. So yeah. if the student has to, to be test on certain area that chat GPT has the ability to do, then you, they shouldn't. Yeah, it's the same thing, I think. Right. So this is my take on it. I feel like um, there's no point in banning chat GPT because it will be widespread in a few, like now it's widespread already. I think it will remain widespread. And uh, what should be done is that the exam question should just take into account that chat GPT is available and probably do more higher order thinking than just regurgitation. I mean, I never really like regurgitation questions anyway, right? So, you know, this might be a good thing for education. Yeah, so I think chat GPT should be used by students. Just make the questions such that it's unusable. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> But then the, a lot of coding question already can be done with ChatGPT. How are you going to do about it? Oh, just um, don't don't test coding. <laughs> well, you can ask the students to do some specific project that is not like because ChatGPT does make mistakes, so you cannot use it fully for coding. You need to really know your stuff if you want to do it. Oh, yeah, but like me for beginner, you have to start from a certain level, right? The entry level, the the level of difficulty is just like that. Mm. Then the chat, it is possible. It's, it can be done with the chat GPT. Then, how are you going to do about it? So maybe in that case, then you have to do some form of like um closed book. <laughs> I, I I don't know. So that, that that is one problem. Or maybe, maybe we should just embrace the fact that it can do coding. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but actually, you need a trained programmer to 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 use chat GPT because if the code turns out wrong, it is very hard to debug if you don't know how to debug it in real life. Yeah, so while ChatGPT generates code fast, it also generates er uh, codes with errors quite often. So you need to know how to debug. Yeah, so I still think there's a the role for humans here. ChatGPT uh, is not uh, perfect. All right, so let's move on to the next question. Like, I don't know if you all heard of it, but uh, ChatGPT is going to acquire be acquired by Microsoft for 10 billion soon. So you want to use it for stuff like web search. Do you think it can be used for web search? That's the thing. Like, can it be a replacement for web search? You type in your prompt and out comes the GPT's answer. Okay, so maybe I give my take on this, okay? And the answer is probably no, okay? It's not, not that reliable because like you can imagine stuff. 
which are not factual. Yeah, so this, this is actually not very good for web search where we want the reliability stuff. But I mean, if you could somehow make the data reliable, then maybe yes, maybe you can link the sources and stuff. So this is what I think what Sparrow, which is the DeepMind AI is trying to do. But um, basically like make it reliable, link the sources. But I think this is not uh, possible. Okay, because my take on this is that for generation, you cannot, you will definitely, you will not be truth, you will not be a uh, word for word the same as the source. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's in conflict with, I think this will be in conflict with the, the, the case for generation model. So if you want to do like some fact checking one, yeah, maybe you can condition your facts to the generation model. Maybe it will work. I'm not too sure. But as of now, I see a tension, I see a conflict, and I don't think it will be suitable. For web search, actually, I mean, it can be. But what if what if what if you just use to interpret your input? Sometimes it's, maybe it's not the search engine cannot understand fully. Then they help to interpret your input. Maybe yes. So, uh, one thing I can see Chat GPT being used for is to do some early initial prompting or early initial idea finding. So, based on the ideas that you have from Chat GPT, then you can guide your search on the search engine. So it, it can definitely help with the first step of of finding your answer which is to do some form of priming to, to get some ideas. So maybe you can write this down, like may be useful for initial ideas, which then you verify with search engine later. Yeah, so I, I think this, this will be okay. Yeah, so also um, one thing about ChatGPT is that uh, it, it kind of like um, also is intending to be used on like office products like Microsoft Excel and so on. So I think this use case, actually, I, I, I'll give you a tick. Okay, I think this is okay. Like given the first few cells, how do you autofill the next one? You can do chat, chat GPT to like try to infer the relations. I think that's fine. Yeah, so this one, I think is okay. Uh, this, this is what I call uh, relation finding. Or uh, basically like uh, linking concepts. I think this is this is okay to do. Yeah, but maybe not as a search engine. Yeah. A a any other viewpoints on this? Okay, now we move on to the last question. So the last question is, do you think chat GPT is conscious and sentient? So, I mean, anyone you want to just try? <laughs> do you think it's a living person? Is chat GPT a living person? It has feelings and emotions. And it's like trapped in a system. Like, you know, the Google Lambda, you know? I think it simply means Turing test is not good enough. Yeah, so I I think the answer is quite clear, right? The answer is no. Okay, I hope I hope this is clear for everyone because it is still just a pattern recognition, pattern recognition or pattern pattern matching machine. It might seem like it is alive. Okay, it might seem that it is alive, but humans, uh, we tend to anthropomorph anthropomorphize, I think that's the word. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know how to spell it. Fice. Anthropomorphize. Okay, but, but basically, the idea is like we tend to attribute human uh, attributes to machines. Yeah, we tend to say like, oh, uh, this calculator is so good like it's, i mean if, if let's say the the machine can respond back in a way that is human like we tend to treat it like a human so i think it is easy to fall into the trap to think that like chat gpt is actually alive conscious but actually the main reason why we feel this way is because we are just imbued to think that way yeah so the answer is obviously no because it's just a machine so i think this question is is just there just to let people know that you know it's not conscious. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, not actually. We have come to the end of today's uh, presentation. I hope it has been useful. Yeah. Do you have any other final questions you want to ask before we end the session? Just one last question. So, if you remove, you only if you only use the decoder part of the transformer, right? Your input becomes your sentence, right? Natural language. Yes. Where whereas. With, with the encoder part, the input to the decoder is something output from the encoder. 
Yes. Which then is the, like a embedding kind of thing. Yeah, that the encoder part will encode in some form of I feel memory where you have a context that you want to remember and then you keep referencing that context in your decoder. So there's some use for that, like for translation. You want to keep your original sentence intact. Yeah. If and, you were to and why sorry, you continue first. Oh no, I just say if you were to bring if you remove the encoder and just put the encoder part in the decoder, um, you can potentially lose out on like remembering the initial sentence context. So that's that's one of the trade-offs that, that has been done by GPT in order to increase model size. Because you take away encoder, you have like and why? Yeah, you can double the encoder size. As you can double the decoder size because you remove the encoder part. Like and why is it without encoder, you can't do bidirectional bi directional training? Uh, you can't do bidirectional because GPT is trained to predict the next word. And you don't know. I'm talking about like a bird kind of uh, architecture. We saw oh, you you can you can do but with uh you can do but without to do next text predict next word prediction. You can without the encoder. But is actually the encoder, actually. Oh, but, sorry. So without encoder cannot do by by direction. Right? Yeah, you, you can add a decoder module to it that uh, generates the next text. That's for but. But you but you have to have the encoder to do the bidirectional. Mm, don't need to actually. Your yeah. you can de oh, yeah, actually that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um because your decoder you don't want to give, give the next text, right? Yeah. Oh actually, yeah, true. Okay, okay. So it depends okay. on the use case. If it's a like answer, like doing a sentiment analysis, but I think you can give it the entire text. Then you can give it a uh, self attention with the entire input text from the decoder. Yeah, but if you are doing the next text generation, you cannot give it the entire text. Yeah, so it depends on what you are using it for. GPT is using it for text generation, so we cannot give it the entire sequence. But it's still possible to give the entire sequence without a certain worth to the decoder. It doesn't matter whether you give it to the encoder or decoder. It's just like okay. okay so it's it's just technical terms. It's just like where you want to link the model to. So I mean, we can talk about it as encoder and decoder, but ultimately the thing is, if you use the original architecture, the the part here is like this is the output. So if you don't want to do it as output, you can do another layer here. You can do like a linear layer here, and then you can do like sentiment analysis or something. Yeah, you. you so, so instead of doing like the next word prediction, you can also like train a separate final layer. So to me, I feel like you can do this final layer like from the from the encoder, you can do it here also, or you can do it from the decoder also. So to me, it's, it's just semantics. I mean, regardless of whether it's like the encoder or decoder, the idea is that you process it, you go to a final layer and then out comes something. So like, I mean, I, I don't want to go into the technicalities like why encoder, why decoder. This was for a translation problem. But if you are doing other problems, actually you don't really have a much of a distinction between the encoder and the decoder. I mean, all of them are the same, you see? All of them have the same architecture. Except the, the encoder to decoder part, the value is from decoder. The key and the query is from encoder. Mm, Whereas for... For other things, it's all from the same, same, same place. Mm, correct. Why well, I feel this part here, this can be treated as an external memory bank. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so maybe we move away from the terminology encoder and decoder. Maybe you can treat this as an external memory bank because you can refer to this memory bank anytime in the decoder. It doesn't change, you okay. see. Yeah. Okay. So, I think uh, whether or not you do self attention or like or like truncated attention which is like the mass attention it all depends on the use case yeah okay. but if for bird if you want to do bird training you can give it all the pre all the words at the back no problem okay just that when you were to do your generation you have to do a mass and you have to do the masking here okay yeah if, if you use the bird architecture yeah so there's really a lot of variations of the transformer but the key idea in the transformer is to query key value and then you do it iteratively more and more times to get a very, very well defined embedding. All right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay if not, uh, I would like to just end here. This is a good slide to end on. Yeah, I'll see you around next time. Okay, bye bye.